The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Hey, Kara Oosteros here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Canola School episode, and I have here with me Gregory Seklich, who is an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. How's it going today? Pretty awesome, Kara. Thank you for asking. Good to be here. Um, where, how are crop conditions doing? You're up in the Peace region of Alberta. Can you talk a bit about what crop conditions are like right now? They're fairly variable from north to south and east to west. Uh, I would say that the further south you go, the more water damage we have from the uh, the deluges that we saw in, in June and July. It really manifested themselves there. Uh, further north, um, I actually haven't been that, that far north yet uh, in the latter half of the summer. I'll be heading up there uh, quite shortly. But uh, crops in the, the, the far north piece are, are doing quite well. Um, good timely rains, nothing drowned out. Uh, so it's, um, I'm actually looking forward to getting up there and seeing some some crops that aren't as as moisture damaged as we're seeing here in uh, in North Central and, and Central Alberta. Absolutely. So it is now mid-August here, and we are looking at scouting for Bertha armyworm. Can you talk a bit about what producers should be looking for when they're going out to their fields? Okay, well, even before we go out to the fields, the provinces each have pretty fantastic resources um, in association with the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, uh, which is a blog that I would recommend everybody uh, log into, prairiepestmonitoringnetwork.com, um, and and keep an eye on what the local environmental conditions and, and insect uh, risks probabilities are in your neighborhood. It's 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 comprehensive. There is a lot of information there. It's fantastic. Uh, but there are uh, prairie-wide monitoring programs aimed at catching Bertha armworm moths throughout the summer to try and predict where the hotspots will be and, and really focus attention on where, where scouting is, is more more critical and, 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 and less critical. And so I've got the Alberta map uh, open in front of me. I'm, I'm an uh, Alberta and British Columbia agronomist. And uh, right around my... Uh, my house, actually, if, if you log in, you'll see a, a pretty dense cluster of elevated risk. Um, so the, the, the central and uh, uh, east piece are, are definitely an area where producers are going to want to be going out and, and scouting fairly intensively for, for these, these creatures. They can be extremely catastrophic. So what does damage actually look like out in the field? The birth armyworm is a cutworm. Uh, basically, it's the, the same group of, of caterpillars as the uh, as all of the other cutworm species. They're just a bit of a different life cycle. Uh, and what they're going to be feeding on is the basically all the above ground material of, of canola. They're, they have a, a huge preference for canola. Uh, they, they evolved evidently uh, in close proximity to lamb's quarters, which is kind of neat, the, the, the weed. But uh, they, they do have an overwhelming preference for canola. So they're going to be eating basically all the above ground material. And as we get out of out of July and into August and, and later into August, we start seeing more and more reproductive material, so pods and, and seeds, which are obviously very energy dense, and that is where the uh, the, the worms will, will concentrate their feeding. And what you'll notice in, in field is it's fairly aggressive bite marks and stripping of all the green material off the pods and stems. And then a really severe outbreak, actually. And I've seen this uh, just a handful of times, uh, thankfully, over my career. The entire field will actually turn white because the worms, um, uh, as an army worm, will move across the field in, in a horde and eat all of the green material and just leave the, the white stems, the, the, the pith material, behind. And so the field actually looks bone white from, from the road or, or, or patches of, of the field, anyway, where the, uh, where the worms were, were heaviest. So that's, that's the kind of damage we're going to be looking for. They are a chewing insect, and they're going to be stripping off uh, leaf material material initially and then into, into the pods. So when you're going out to your field and you're assessing your damage, uh, what sort of economic thresholds are actually out there for the birther armyworm? Well, uh, awesomely, the uh, economic thresholds for Bertha armyworm are, are pretty well defined in literature. So we have had a number of projects over the years that really did pin down how much damage each insect can do. And it's, so it's, it's very associated with the value of the crop and the cost of control. So we have those charts, uh, like in our Canola Watch archives and the Canola Encyclopedia. And, and, and right now, you know, if your if your cost of uh, of application is, is, is of an insecticide, including the damage you're doing with the uh, with the equipment, so um, you know the the equipment going across the field uh, is somewhere is going to be somewhere around like like ten to fifteen dollars an acre, and at you know a, a ten to twelve dollar a bushel 
value, you would be somewhere in that, you know, 15 to 18 worms per square meter or so to, to justify making that application. Now, these things can get extremely uh, voracious when they're in an outbreak situation. So, like, while the chart and the, and the graph has damage and, and economics going up to into the 30s, if you look at the chart, basically any field that you're in where you exceed 20 worms per square meter, we're going to want to see you do an insecticide application on there. Um, the, the amount of damage that they can do at that number, like in excess of 20 per square meter, is it almost becomes exponential. So um, while we really advise people to pay attention to the thresholds on the low side, once they're on the high side of that chart, it, the 20 is pretty much the hard stop. That's uh, start the engine and, uh, and go at that point. And are there any beneficials that actually eat the birth armyworm? There are a handful of beneficials that go after Bertha armyworm. Uh, when they're small, there are a number of carabid beetles and uh, just generalist predators that you'll find throughout the canopy. Uh, damselfly, uh, ladybird beetles, uh, lacewing larvae, like all of these things. Uh, my, my all-time favorite, the carabid beetles. Anyone who's seen my, my presentations on beneficial insects will see me get wildly excited about the, the kind of damage that the carabid beetle can do to uh, cutworm species. Um uh, but even 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 more importantly, though the the outbreaks are usually more controlled by other natural processes uh, like like parasitism by a, a small handful of very specific uh, parasitic wasps that. Uh, that, that help control their numbers, but also uh, a, a virus that uh, that will spread through their population when there when there gets to be enough of them, and they, which is usually why these outbreaks only last two or three years. You get that explosion in population, and then you get uh, some some density dependence uh, for the for, for the virus to start spreading through. So you need to have a certain amount of them in contact with each other to uh, to have that virus spread through them and, and eventually kill them. So these these outbreaks in in specific areas tend to last you know two to three years or so. They're, they're fairly cyclical throughout the prairies. Um, and, and it really is natural controls that, that end our outbreaks. Uh, my, my friend Scott Mears once told me that we've never, ever sprayed an outbreak away. And we can uh, temporarily manage uh, you know, individual fields with insecticides, but uh, the, the long-term is uh, management strategy has to be beneficial insects. Is there certain parts of the plant or certain parts of the field that you'll find them specifically at? Uh, pretty much throughout the canopy. So when we're, when we're out scouting, the... Uh, the idea is to go out into the field uh, into a, a number of places and ideally not right up against the road. I, I'm aware of, of you know how difficult it is to walk through fully potted canola in the end of August with the mosquitoes buzzing around your head and uh, it's, uh, it, it's not pleasant, I know. Uh, it, is, it is vitally important though. Um, so go to a number of places throughout the field and then grab the canopy and just shake the ever-living garbage out of it. Um, and like... Uh, Pound it around, shake it, slap it a little bit. You can get downright rude with the with the plants in that in that area, and then uh, peel the plants aside, get down to the ground, and, and start counting it in. Uh, we're we're looking for thresholds in, in the, the square meter number, but um, but you just kind of want to mark out a fifty centimeter by fifty centimeter quarter square meter. Count the number of insects that have landed in that area, and then you know multiply that by four, obviously, to get your your number per square meter or so. Uh, and that's like. Probably right, like like sixteen or seventeen is probably going to be a, a, like kind of the economic threshold right now for the cost of control and the uh, and the, the value of the crop this year. But again, like like twenty is that hard stop. So if you've got you know five in that quarter square meter, it's it's time to uh, to fire up and, and go spring. And you're really going to want to look for them. Uh, they, they they do tend to want to hide. So you'll need to you know pick up the leaf litter, uh, look underneath some of the straw or residue that happens to be there because they'll, uh, they'll they'll curl up and hide underneath it. So as far as uh, yield impacts, do you have any percentages on what it actually does to that final yield in the canola crop? Uh, without control in, in in numbers in excess of 20 per square meter, uh, they could pretty much make your crop yield zero. Um, like they're that, that's basically the, the how, how severe and how serious these insects are. So like we don't want to toy around with them. We don't want to treat them lightly. If they're if they're below that economic threshold, you know, like they're going to do a bushel or two an acre damage, um, which is you know it, it looks a little bit unsightly, but um, but the you know the, the cost of control would have been more than, than what you lost in uh, in yield in those cases. So uh, so that that's really it, it really does completely span the gamut. So nationally what the the dollars that we lose to 
Birth of Army Worm in an outbreak year actually really isn't isn't that isn't that huge because they do tend to be cyclical. We do have a pretty aggressive scouting regime for them. Uh, every year when there's an outbreak, we'll hear of a field or two that has been lost and and, and some fields that had a little more damage to them than we'd like to see before they got sprayed. But um, but we really do have good uh, predictive models for them. Uh, we, we know when they're going to be emerging based on you know when the eggs were laid and the amount of heat received throughout the season. So we know when to tell people to start scouting. Uh, we know how much damage each individual worm can do. And, and, and from that, we have really good economic threshold data. So this is probably one of the pests that we, that we know the most about from an ecology perspective. Okay, awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just with regards to Bertha armyworm scouting, uh, there are a number of small green worms that will be found in the canopy when we're out scouting for Bertha armyworms as well. So really make sure that the, the species is what we is what you're looking for. Uh, so I took a little video yesterday of a curled up worm with a white stripe down the side of his body. Um, zoomed in on it and even i wasn't 100 percent sure if it was a young diamondback or a young bertha armor room sorry or uh, a larger diamondback moth until i picked it up um and then gave it the little poke test and as it went wiggling and dancing across my palm so that which which pretty much ruled out the uh the bertha armor room and that was that was quite certainly a a diamondback so identification becomes hugely important as well um just because that's these, these thresholds are based on bertha armor rooms alone um the, the threshold for diamondback moth is is a uh, 10 times what it is for Bertha Army Room. We need to be two to 300 per square meter before we'd start worrying about, about spraying them, whereas the, the Bertha Army Worm is, as I mentioned, uh, definitely not more than 20. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara.